In this episode with Dr. Steven Snyder, we discuss the physiology of sexual arousal, how to use mindfulness practices as a powerful tool for enhancing sexual connection, how to maintain sexual inspiration in a long-term monogamous relationship, and how lazy sex can be a good thing. Hello, Steven. Thanks for being with us today. Hello, Sasha. Thanks for joining us. So I guess to kind of kick things off, your book is, you know, called Love Worth Making, and there's a subtitle, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which you may or may not have chosen. (laughs) Subtitle should not be mentioned. (laughs) But basically the book being about how to kind of have fulfilling sex or to continue sex in a long-term relationship along those lines. Um, If somebody were to refer to it as, quote unquote, great sex, Mm -hmm. how would we define that? What, is, what does great sex even mean? Just so we can all be thinking about the same operational definition. Because for some people that might be like having seven orgasms each time I have sex. Or right. One of the things people, I talk about in the book is that uh, orgasm is best considered to be dessert. Um, it's the end of the meal usually, at least for a guy. And after dessert, there's uh, the check and get your coat, catch a cab if you're in Manhattan. And it it tends to be towards the end of things. So unfortunately, a lot of people focus on getting dessert, which leaves you hungry. Couple gets to bed at night and they figure, okay, what's the efficient, most efficient way for both of us to get dessert so that we can go to sleep? And unfortunately, they're still hungry. So what I tell couples is you want to think about sex as like a meal. The appetizers ordinarily, foreplay, should be interesting enough and worthwhile enough in their own right or for their own sake, that you momentarily forget that they're appetizers. Because sex is about being in the moment, paying attention to the moment without judgment. It's exactly what they say about mindfulness. So there's a connection between mindfulness and sex. And then the main course arrives. And you go, whoa, great, I forgot we get to have a main course too. Oh, awesome. And then just as you're almost full, the dessert tray arrives. And you go, there's dessert too? I love this place. This is terrific. So that's the best way, because everything should be in the moment. So great sex is when you're in the moment through appetizers, main course, and then dessert. And after great sex, you experience, wow, it took me someplace really special, and I feel wonderful about myself. Is there an equivalent of of getting takeout, like great sex (laughs) via takeout delivery? (laughs) Well, um, you can certainly go to the icebox late at night and... uh, get some cheesecake if you want oh, yeah. and just have dessert. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But I usually encourage people not to do it too much. In the, my book, I talk about that there are two roads to orgasm. There's the high road and there's the low road. You get the cheesecake late at night from the icebox. That's okay. But it's kind of the low road to orgasm because you weren't really that aroused to begin with. But you know, the right kind of friction in the right kind of place can give you an orgasm. The high road is where you're in the moment And you're not really thinking about the fact that there's going to be dessert. It's like at a really good meal at a really good restaurant. You're not thinking about dessert. You may have a little eye on the dessert menu, but it's not your major focus. The high road is where uh, you really get into a state of psychological arousal. One of the reasons I wrote the book was because nobody really talks about the phenomenology, the actual facts of psychological arousal. You know, Masters and Johnson in the 50s and 60s studied physiologic arousal. So they discovered about the lubrication and how that happens and muscle tone and blood flow and all sorts of things. But nobody's ever really discovered the secrets of psychological arousal. I think one of the reasons it can't be studied scientifically because it's completely subjective. So what I did in trying to fill in the gap there is I began asking people, what does it feel like when you're aroused? And after listening to hundreds of people talk to me about this, I kind of whittled it down in my mind to three general areas. And this put this in chapter one of the book because I thought it was just so important. So if you only read chapter one, you get it. So the first aspect of psychological arousal is that you're absorbed. This is where mindfulness comes in. You're in the moment. If all goes well, you're not really thinking about other things. and People who make porn sites know this because they know that if you've got work to do and you get aroused while you're on the porn site, you're going to stay on the porn site because you don't really care about your work. That's normal. 
It's what happens to teenagers when they're out on a date and they come back at four in the morning and parents say, well, where were you? What happened? The kid goes, oh, I don't know. They have no idea. They were just aroused and they lost track of time because they were completely absorbed in the moment. So absorption uh, is, is, is number one. For most people, it also includes losing some of your native intelligence. So you become just kind of dumb and happy. Good sex makes you really dumb and d- great sex can make you downright stupid. I mean, you know, you don't really, you know, you say what's your address and you can't really say it. <laughs> Leads us to the second part of arousal. And the second part of arousal is regression. I used to be a psychoanalyst back in my younger years. I always joke that I'm a I'm recovering Freudian psychoanalyst and don't do it anymore, but I learned a lot from it. And one of the Freud's great insights was that our adult selves are just uh, a thin veneer over this seething mass of infantile feelings. And in sex, if all goes well, we go back to that infantile state of mind. And sex really revives and is a, a reminiscence of primal early states from infancy where the physical and the psychological weren't distinguished, where touch was love, where feeding was love, where physical comfort was love. And so those later silos don't really get developed. And that explains some of the paradoxical things about sexual arousal. It's very uh, communal. You feel highly connected to your partner, but it's also extremely selfish. You don't really want to hear about how their day went. You just want them to make nice noises and uh, tell you you're wonderful. The other real paradox about sexual arousal, which connects to its regressive aspect, is that it's enjoyable, but it's not really a frivolous kind of carefree fun. It also has a very serious aspect. It's like, don't bother me. I'm doing something very, very serious here. We're not laughing and whooping it up and having a great time in a way. Instead, we're intently focused. And I think that connects back to the fusion of joy and seriousness that happens during early infancy, because the functions of early infancy are profoundly serious. Nourishment, protection, these things are life or death at that point. Bonding is a matter of life or death at that point. So sex feels serious. So, and then the last part of psychological arousal, after absorption and regression is validation. Sex should give you a feeling of, yeah, that's, that's really, really me. Oh, that's exactly where I really, really live. Now you really, really know me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for bringing me to where I really, really, really live. So great sex has this feeling of validation. of Yeah, that's really and me. And authenticity. And authenticity. Yeah, absolutely. When you were talking about the focus, um, yeah, and kind of the serious aspect, because on one hand, I think that the high road, low road. Sometimes people probably do want to take the low road, so it's finding the yeah. the balance between. Sometimes that. you just want to have cheesecake. Yeah, yeah, I know that everybody listening, when you say be selfish, yes, will say all the people that I have sex with are too selfish. Exactly, they can say, so isn't that what we're we trying to get away from? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so. You know, let's cut to the chase. I think what we're basically talking about is masculinity. Very few people accuse women or their female partners of being too selfish in bed. In fact, most people feel that women uh, often have trouble being selfish enough, but men often get accused of being too selfish in bed. They just want to come, and afterwards they don't care, and they just roll over. I call that masculinity 1.0. Masculinity 1.0, maybe it existed 50 years ago. And maybe it sometimes exists with drunken hookups today. I'm sure it does. But it's not what I see in the office. I don't see that many women coming into my office today in 2019 and saying, my partner just, they just seem oblivious to my pleasure. I see masculinity 2.0. Masculinity 2.0 is the guy's read all the books. He knows where the clitoris is. He wants to pay attention to it. He wants to do the right thing. And he's going around and around and around and around. She comes in and she says, I'm bored out of my mind. It's like he's just trying to get a good grade. And he just wants to be a good lover. And I can't stand it anymore. It's so funny how it switches between. And so to clarify for the listeners again, that the difference between the necessity or 
also the expectations of casual sex versus yeah. like long term and the people you see in your office because I just did another interview with hmm. a woman who does research about casual sex. Oh, who's that? Um, Jana? Is that Jana? Jana, Jana, sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, She's one of the only people who does research about casual sex. Right. Yeah. And so her talking about how women need to be more selfish and men need to be more giving, which I, I helped it. her rephrase as women need to be more selfful to avoid the negative connotation uh -huh. and men maybe more generous. But again, it being in the context of casual sex versus these long term relationships. What I think of, if I, could, if I could give if I could give a uh, advice for men is men need to give themselves permission to be more passionate. Mm -hmm. Passion is everything. Yeah. I think in the 21st century, at least among the younger people, a certain degree of generosity is assumed at least in a long-term relationship. It's the deficit of passion that I really see in my, in mm -hmm. my practice. And, passion. you know, my, my book is really oriented towards what's really the holy grail question in sex yeah. therapy, which is passion in long-term yeah. relationships. Does it exist? Can you get it? If so, how? Who, yeah, it's not. And I have a kind of a different take on it than most people, which is why I wrote the book. And so, you know, the book being based on your experiences here, I'm just curious if mm -hmm. you... Have found or know of any cross culturally uh, any cross cultural differences in regards to the passion in the long term in the relationships, or I don't know if there are differences in the patterns that come up or the solutions that people. It's a great question. Uh, my book is primarily geared towards the uh, uh, post industrial West, and uh, it identifies stuff that I see in my office among primarily educated. Uh, people who know the basics about sexual anatomy and physiology. The rest of the world, that's really not the case. In the rest of the world, uh, sex is mostly in a horrible state. Most women just do it just to preserve the integrity of the marriage. Uh, guys cheat all over the place. Guys are, pre are preoccupied with uh, primitive notions of manhood and whether they're being seen as a man within the relationship. And, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of spared that for the most part. In your experience putting together this book, writing this book, what's one, at least one thing that you learned, maybe unexpected or kind of a finding that you had actually in writing the book rather than knowing it going into yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, it was the uh, mindfulness revolution. Uh, I have a colleague... Uh, on the West Coast, Lori Brado at the University of uh, 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 British Columbia at Vancouver, who uh, got the intuition uh, over a decade ago that there was something about mindfulness practice that could be useful for sex. And she's written some very, very interesting papers um, in which she's looked at the result of mindfulness on women's uh, sexual desire, women's healing from sexual pain, women's healing from trauma, and all sorts of stuff. They're just beginning to apply it to men. and. I think the aha moment for me was when I started to get involved with this and uh, did mindfulness training myself. And I began to think of what the, the ordinary definition uh, of mindfulness, which is uh, paying attention in the present moment without judgment or with as little judgment as possible. Both for and, yourself, not, not just like for your partner, but also I think a big problem people have is judging themselves. Oh, totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and I thought, you know, attention, well, sex is all about attention, which we can talk a lot about more. And I think that's why we have sex rather than masturbate. We just like to have somebody else's attention. And present moment, well, sex is all about the present moment because absorption is fundamental to sexual arousal. And without judgment, judgment is really the principal thing that gets in the way of sex arousal for most people, you know. How do my thighs look? You know, is my penis big enough? Did her last boyfriend give her a better orgasm than I give her? What's this mean and so forth? And uh, can I last longer? That kind of thing. And will I be able to come? Is he getting tired? Is his hand going to get tired? That kind of thing. So all these kind of judgments, those are the principal enemies of sexual arousal. So it lined up very nicely, actually, that... Uh, the mindfulness paradigm, uh, although one doesn't usually think of sex in terms of mindfulness, the elements are all three elements are there, attention, the present moment, and as little judgment as possible. So I thought to myself, now that's something I didn't know before I started to write the book. 
And that became the basis of all sorts of uh, explorations in the book. One of the other things that I did as I wrote the book is I was always looking for an alternative to the sex date because everybody says that established couples, you're not going to have the impulse to have sex very often because you've got all sorts of other stuff on your mind. So you need to make a date. Make a date, circle it in the calendar. Thursday evening, we're going to have sex. Turn off our phones and so forth. The problem is that it's Thursday evening. You took off your phones. You get naked. You get in bed together. And you're not really hungry for sex. So it's going to be bad sex. And then it's also going to be negative reinforcement. Yeah, totally. And so you're just going through the motions. So you needed something to do first to kind of tune you up. And so the technique that I developed, uh, which I call in the book the two-step, Step two is having sex. Step one is a mindfulness practice. And the crucial thing about step one is that it's not mutual. One of the things I loved about mindfulness training is mindful communication is not mutual. You communicate something to the other person. The other person just listens to what you're saying and keeps in reserve their own reactions to it. And then they just give back to you what you said. And there's something clean and simple and refreshing about that. And paradoxically, you feel closer to that person. And then they do the same thing. And they feel closer to you. So I use this with couples all the time now. It's called mindful communication. It's fundamental. Step two is to have sex in whatever fashion you want to have sex, whatever you feel like doing. Step one is not mutual. It's solitary. You get to bed together, get naked together, and your agenda is to spend some time together doing nothing. Each of you become aware where you are, how you're feeling, become aware of your breathing, become aware of the temperature of your body, do a rough inventory of where your body is. I always check out my feet because I enjoy being in my feet and I don't do that very often. I go, hey, they're, they're really part of me. Yeah, that's, that's me down there. <laughs> um, and so you're just tuning up your awareness instrument. And then after you've tuned up your awareness instrument and you feel balanced and present, then you turn to your partner and you have sex. And it works much better than a sex date. So my goal for the world is to have all the magazine articles that talk about sex dates delete it and instead put two-step because that works and sex dates don't. You know, the whole have sex before dinner versus after. Um, I... It's very similar. I think a lot of people talk about the classic problem of you get home at night after work, you're tired, you get in bed, you watch Netflix, and then don't even try, or then you try and have sex. But you're half asleep. Why or what? Of course that's not going to work. That doesn't work for anybody. The people who are actually having sex are not waiting until it's the last thing in the day. First of all, clearly not a priority if it's the last thing. Second of all, don't think so highly of yourself that when you're half asleep you're going to want to. So doing it earlier in the day before dinner or at least before Netflix. The idea of having sex first, I think you should always have sex first in anything because then everything else is to go out and celebrate. So you have sex first and then you go out and celebrate. I live in Manhattan where people tend to have dinner a little bit on the late side and uh, they may have a glass of wine which is mixed because for most women, a glass of wine is a bit of an aphrodisiac. So that's nice. But then you got a full belly and it's tired and you just, you know, you, you, you know, you don't really feel at your peak. So it's a good idea to have sex first. I also think it's a good idea in the weekend. A lot of couples bump for around and do this whole dance about when they're going to have sex on the weekend. Do it right away. Saturday morning, wake up Saturday morning, have sex. You're good. When you, in some of your interviews, talk about the equivalent uh you talk about people going out to buy a sex toy and just needing novelty and that that's not the solution which i also talk to people a lot about um and kind of the mental tools being you can Mm -hmm. buy the sex toy that's great but if you're looking for a band-aid for your relationship that's not the answer because the problem is generally not actually unless it's a medical problem it's not about sex so Mm -hmm. you can use that as a tool to say why did i buy this how can I talk to my partner about it? What does it mean? Et cetera. But in terms of if we are looking for novelty in some way, what would be your kind of metaphorical sex toy? Okay. Um, I think I would disagree with you on a fundamental level. 
I don't think we're looking for novelty. I think we crave novelty because in the same way we crave sugar. All children crave novelty. That's why we call it a sex toy. You give a kid a toy and what happens? They play with it for two weeks and then it ends up as junk in the corner and they want another toy. This is the same thing with adults when it comes to various forms of erotic novelty. It's like Fifty Shades of Grey sold 100 million copies. That's a lot of copies. Wow. And it got a lot of women very excited for two and a half weeks. Right. And then everything settled back to normal. That's in the nature of novelty. If you play the novelty game, you're always having to ramp up novelty. And you see it with porn. Porn is a, is a great illustration of this, unfortunately. A novelty, what's novel in porn these days? How can We're always having to ramp up the novelty. Half the stuff on Pornhub these days is stepbrother does it with stepsister with stepmother looking on. It's weird. Mm-hmm. It's like, are there any other barriers left to break? I'm not sure there are, but I'm sure we'll find out in the next 10 years. Exactly. So my book, I go in a completely different direction. I got tired of hearing about go on a sexy date, mm-hmm. go to a bar and pretend you don't know each other. That's not going to work. It's going to be two weeks. You'll get something out and then things will be exactly the same. So... You have a sexual, one might say, to use a hackneyed phrase, inner child. You have a sexual inner child that craves novelty. Just like your regular child craves sugar and new toys and all sorts of things. And it's always going to be like that. So um, we all have that in, in, in our hearts. So what do we do? What I tend to recommend to couples is you just accept that. And you accept that you need to be a good parent to your sexual child and set appropriate limits and you say that hot person you saw that day or that you uh, uh, were turned on by that day, yes, that was wonderful, wasn't it? Yes, that's really nice. Um, You can't have them. They're not yours. But that's okay. We're going to go home and we're going to be fine. Um, So the way we're going to do it is we're going to give the sexual mind other stuff that it really needs. So we're going to do the two-step and we're just going to tune in. And if we've gained energy from the erotic universe that day, we certainly want to enjoy that erotic turn on mm-hmm. that we've gained that day from feeling excited by what's around us. But we're just directing it, bringing it home, and we're going to be together. And this is good married sex. And it's different from hookup sex. It doesn't have that novel turn-on quality. It's not a toy, not novel, but it's deep. And the idea is that it's a deeper experience because it's a river. You know, the old saying that you uh, don't never step in the same river twice. Once you get into a mindful focus, you realize that your partner is not the same person as they were the night before. You're not the same person as you were the night before. And although it's the same river, it's actually a different river. And it's having the clarity to listen to, to, the, to the, the, the tiny differences. And there's always, always something uh, to notice and to be absorbed in. Yeah, and t- thinking of that, as I had heard you mention before, is kind of the, a religious sacrament in terms of it requires commitment. Um, Absolutely. It requires sex, effort. It's not easy to go you know, to church sacra- every Sunday yeah, morning. Sac- sacram- <laughs> sacrament is, 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 is going to turn off a lot of people, so it's yeah, yeah, a little yeah. controversial, especially <laughs> if, you're, if you're like a formerly religious and you lost faith right, in, in the, right. in the so church just, and so forth. But I like it. Yeah, but I like yeah. it as an idea because I think I just had heard people have... Pe- yeah, yeah. It's, it's because people have, a, people have an impulse towards the sacred. Yeah. And that impulse doesn't get gratified very much in secular Thinking life. Thinking of it as a bit like spirituality, which is something that you yes. incorporate into your life. Um, if you have certain practices or uh, activities that are part of it, committing to making those happen, whether That's it's important to who you are. So what I, what I say in the book, you know, the idea is uh, sex with a long-term partner something that you strongly crave all the time? No. Should it be something that feels like an obligation? Heavens no. There's something in the middle between those two. And that thing in the middle is, I think of, I'm a religious person, I think of as a sacrament. When you go to bed with your committed partner, you're engaging in a sacrament in your relationship. I think a lot of people would prefer that to other types of religion. Of course. Of course. 
it's a nice sacrament. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to read through a lot of prayers and stuff. You just uh, kind of tune up. Yeah. But that's what most really religious people do because they're always kind of looking to find their inspiration because inspiration gets lost all the time. All religious people know that you start with inspiration, it doesn't last forever, and eventually you have to find where else you're going to find it. And so you're always trying to open yourself up to, to, to inspiration. And you're looking for some kind of uh, uh, help in a way of finding inspiration again. Hey everyone, quick announcement. If you like what you're listening to, please take just one minute to rate, and more specifically, to write a review of our podcast. It's the only way for us to work our way into the magical unknown algorithms that decide what podcasts do or don't get recommended to other people on your favorite podcasting platform. We know it sounds like a silly side note, but it's a small favor with the power to make a big difference, and we'd really appreciate it. And if you want more content like this, be sure to follow us on Instagram where we post awesome stories, do Q&As and takeovers with experts, and have links to sign up for our digital book club, which is actually a weekly content curation, including other podcasts, TED Talks, Netflix series, and documentaries to help you continue to better understand yourself and your own identity so that you can live better relationships as a result. Join us and follow us to help us change the conversation and the culture surrounding intimacy and relationships. And in case you can't remember all this, well, I made a special website for you, bbxx.world slash lazy. Just kidding, about the lazy part, not about the website. That's for real. So go check it out. That's all. Back to the show now. Thanks again and stay amazing. You mentioned porn. Mm -hmm. Um... And maybe how it's not. Uh, I don't. I don't even actually remember exactly how you mentioned the porn. But uh, if you could speak, what do you think of porn and okay. and camera angle? I think porn. Uh, I wrote an article about this on Psychology Today. Porn gratifies a very very basic human need, which is to watch other people having sex. You know, for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years on the plains of Africa. We wandered around as hunter-gatherers uh, in bands of between 30 and 100 people or something like that. There were no bedroom doors. There are no locks. Two people are having sex. Everybody else knows it. And everybody else would watch. And until the advent of monogamy, everybody else would join in. You know, we're from the chimpanzee bonobo part of the ape family. That's a promiscuous part of the ape family. Um, people just line up. And it's your turn, and then you have a chance. So that's where we come from. So we're, uh, we're built on a promiscuous chassis, one might say. We're like uh, a minivan that's, that's built on a sports car chassis. So what evolution did is it took that basic chimpanzee chassis, and it built this uh, domestic minivan on it by making humans monogamous. So we are a monogamous species, but we also enjoy uh, watching other people have sex. It's just fundamental. People have always loved Does that. Does it need to be other people or could it be videos or mirrors of one's own self? Well, that's a great question. Um, I have a colleague in, in England who said, you know, you can put all the mirrors and videos in the world, but it's not the same as the threesome. <laughs> so, yeah, you can funch around with that. But uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's a basic human fascination. And it's always been. People always want to watch other people having sex. And they always want to see other people naked. It's just a basic thing. So I think that the impulse to watch porn is probably inescapable. The problem with porn, as many people have said, is it doesn't show good lovemaking. What it shows is great camera angles. Porn is all about camera angles. So you get these positions where the people are usually not embracing. They're usually Literally far... Never. They're, they're never embracing, and they are just kind of in these open positions so you can see the penis going in and out of the vagina, and uh, it's just not usually how people have sex. Yeah, and the, the camera angles worked in the, like, a guy going down on a girl, which you, you had mentioned once, yeah, and it's Exactly, you never like, see good cunnilingus. You see a guy with his tongue extended going, ah, Yeah, so everybody it's listening. It's ridiculous. No, that's not. No, that's. Yeah, I feel that's like not the how good you do stuff, it. You don't see. It. You, can't you can't see it because you can't get good counter angles. Just the magical suction. Yeah, anybody who wants a good cunnilingus recipes, 
uh, you know, the book on it is She Comes First by Ian Kerner. And it's, it, he said everything you need to say about Conolingus in that book. That's it. You know, I don't think it's ever going to be improved on. Um, but none of the stuff he talks about in the book makes for good camera angles. Right. For instance, his fundamental technique, I mean, we don't talk a lot about technique on this show, but um, his fundamental technique is called the ice cream lick, where man starts down below the uh, entrance to the vagina with the flat of his tongue, and he imagines the vulva is an ice cream cone on a hot summer's day. And he just licks and licks and licks up until past her clitoris, all the way up and almost to her belly button. Take a deep breath and says, oh, that was wonderful. And then maybe go take another lick. The vibe, the vibe is, this is cunnilingus out of passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just talk about real sex. Yeah. Let's just talk yeah, about, yeah, yeah. you know, you've got all the desire and the passion. Yeah. And do the things that you really like to do mm. match up mm. or not? And sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Let's say a guy really loves cunnilingus. He loves it so much that when they're going to have intercourse, he's sad because his face is farther away from her vulva. There are guys like that. They just love it. It's like their favorite thing in the world. And let's say his partner, it's not really her thing, makes her feel kind of self-conscious. She doesn't really enjoy it that much. She'd rather just have him inside her. And she's always saying, oh, come inside me, come inside me, come inside me. And he goes, no, 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 I really I like this. I'm really getting off on this. So they have kind of a mismatch. Yeah. Mismatches occur. Yeah. Those are real. Now, ideally, in an ideal world, you'd have a questionnaire about these kind of things before you went on Tinder or OkCupid. Um, so you'd be ideally matched. But you don't. So people are not always ideal matches for each other. It's just like positions. Woman can only get off on top or something, and the guy really likes it from behind. You know, this is like all sorts of things like that. So the solution for mismatches is to get very granular about what exactly it is that you like. The guy who really likes to do cunnilingus, does he like the closeness to her vulva? Does he like the scent of it? Very often that's the case. Um, and so there are ways of getting that without his tongue actually being on her. Um, so they can kind of improvise. And that's where you get creative as a couple. And that's where you get the good answers. When each of you gets really granular about exactly what you need and it takes you in slightly different direction with this partner than it was with other partners. What does she really like about being on top? If she's like most women, what she really likes is that she can grind her clitoris down on her pubic bone. Now, you could do that in missionary, too. The guy just has to put his body in a certain position. It's called coital alignment technique. So a lot of part, what we do as sex therapists is kind of really, really getting that fine-grained detail about what people actually need. Mm -hmm. A lot of people kind of uh, associate it with the circumstances. But right. Getting down they to they the label, they or, generalize, yeah. I got to be on top, you know, yeah, I got to yeah. be down there. Yeah. And I think Jana also mentioned um, doing that same thing. You know, it was with casual sex encounters, but the same thing, looking at some of your best or favorite moments or experiences and, and also the ones that didn't go well and really questioning mm -hmm. why. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, to avoid that generalization and really kind of create. I think the casual sex thing is fascinating because I always think the first time with a, with a new partner, it's a little bit like a uh, tourist tour of a foreign capital. You know, you're seeing all the highlights, um, but uh, it really takes a little while before, you know, you're sitting in the cafe after two weeks and they say, you know, can we show you the places we don't show the tourists? And that's what you really want. You want to do the places they don't show the tourists. Yeah. That takes a little while. So I think casual sex is interesting yeah, that way. Yeah, you stay there long if you start speaking another language. Yeah. Um, social media. Yeah, God. Yeah, I was so glad you asked about that. <laughs> so, you ready? I, I'm ready. The thing about social media is that it's narcissistically gratifying. Your cell phone is happy to see you all the time. It has no needs of its own. It just wants to make you happy. It wants to show you colorful pictures, and it looks pretty, and you touch it, and it does interesting things, and it connects you with people who are interested in seeing you and who are giving you likes and follows and all that stuff. I have teenage children, and they take pictures of themselves constantly, and so they're, they're always getting likes and affirmation, and it's tremendously narcissistically gratifying. Sex was supposed to be our primary source of narcissistic gratification. A hundred years ago, the only time you could get that deeply regressive narcissistic satisfaction was in the arms of a loved one for whom at that moment you were the entire universe and the most important thing in the world, that regression back to childish state of need. 
in the old days, the only way you could get narcissism through other routes was to be famous. And then you had fans, you had a following, and you saw what that did to Hollywood marriages. It destroyed them because they're getting all their narcissistic needs met through their public, and they don't have that need for that narcissistic gratification from each other. These days, that's what happens to all of us. We're all famous. We're all trying to be famous. We're all in show business. And we're getting all of our narcissistic needs gratified uh, by our social media and by our connected followings, and very little of it gratified by our uh, uh, sexual encounters. So, big problem. So, the main thing to do with social media is to burn out on it. To get so sick of it and to realize that it's bottomless and that it's endless and that you're just on this uh, treadmill, essentially. And when you're with your loved one, remember that the primary gratification of sex is narcissistic. It's not physical. So it's not just about getting a great blowjob or a great cunnilingus or great intercourse or a great orgasm. It's about seeing yourself reflected in the other person's eyes and feeling that to that other person at that moment, you are the entire world and you are the universe. You had that when you were an infant and you had that when you were a very young child and it's a deep need. Social media satisfies us in kind of a part way, but the only way to really get it satisfied is in somebody's arms. Okay, a specific case of yours yeah, uh, where you really learned something or you'd want to share that you think other people could okay. kind of get some great insight um, out of. Okay, well, obviously I can't talk about a patient because that would be a HIPAA violation. I never talk about patients, but I'll tell you about myself <laughs> because I'm never going to accuse myself of a HIPAA violation. I've been married almost 30 years, happily married, very satisfied, um, and uh, we're married in the presence of a disability. I don't talk about that in the book, um, but it's something I'm fairly open about and talk to patients about it all the time. Um, my wife is actually a stroke survivor. Uh, she had a stroke at the age of 31, I think, right after we got married. Wow. And uh, so she has trouble talking and has trouble using her hand, and she can't, has to walk with a cane. And people will say, oh, yeah, I feel so bad for you. That happened. And then they meet her and they go, I don't feel bad for you at all. She's fine. You know, she just is disabled. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a real education. And so as a sex therapist, I often think, you know, if we can do it, anybody can do it. So some of the emphases in the book come from my own experience. For instance, people talk about how to enhance sex, how to keep long-term passion alive. They talk about doing novelty, new positions, new adventures, and so forth. We can't do any of that stuff. All right, that's out. Um, People talk about uh, uh, sexy talk, sexy games, role-playing. Out. Um, So uh, we're pretty limited that way. So I think what I wanted to do was to share in the book, you know, without being too autobiographical, some of the... uh, some of, some of the things that uh, had inspired us. And I figured if we can do it, anybody can do it. That's incredible. Thank you so much for, for sharing that story. You're welcome. And a lot of those kind of having to confront certain obstacles or tough times or circumstances and events in life often brings us Absolutely. together. And also never, I never miss a chance to embarrass my children. And you have to get creative. Uh, lazy sex. Lazy sex means giving yourself an orgasm even when your partner doesn't really want to participate. So as my uh, colleague Tammy Nelson said, you know, most people react when they uh, get married as if they've just lost their license to touch their own genitals, So, which is crazy because it's an easy way of getting dessert or an orgasm if you want anytime you want to. Most guys do it in the bathroom while watching porn which is a total waste because why not just do it in bed with your partner? All you need is for your partner to have the understanding that this is going to be an okay thing. Most guys love it. Most guys love to see their female partners masturbate. Guys pay lots of good money for that on yeah, porn. Yeah, which is a, exa- the perfect example. that should, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Woman masturbating. Guys will click on that. They like to see that. So, um, Woman you love most in the world masturbating. Best personalized porn ever. Exactly, exactly. So, 
the standard problem that a couple will have. It's late at night and they're going to bed and the husband feels like having sex and the wife says, no, the kid's going to get up in a couple of hours. I'm too tired and if we have sex, I'm going to have to get up and pee afterwards. Otherwise, I get a urinary infection. This is not worth the trouble. So the guy will say, could you give me a blowjob or a hand job? She goes, eh, that's not sexy for me. I don't want to do that. It's too much work and sex should never feel like work. So the guy goes, how about some lazy sex? She goes, great. Lies on his back, gives himself an orgasm, and she just cuddles up next to him and maybe strokes his chest. Um, and she's just there so he can experience her scent, knows she's there. It's a you get a certain percentage of the stuff you're ordinarily getting from sex. You're in bed. It's a nice kind of thing. And it creates a nice Pavlovian cue because the climax is happening with your partner mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting until she goes to sleep and then sneaking off to the other room and looking at porn. Because in that case, what happens is your mind starts to associate her falling asleep with sexual excitement. You don't want to do that. You want to associate her being awake with sexual excitement. A lot of marriages get in trouble that way because the guy gets sexually excited when he hears his wife's car leaving the driveway to go out. Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh, she's going to be away doing groceries. I get 10 minutes of uh, looking at porn. And then he hears her key come back in the door that she's coming. He goes, uh-oh, no sex. So her presence becomes a negative just... sexual signal. And that problem occurs in a lots and lots of different, yeah. different couples. Um, and so I, being a big proponent and have told lots of friends and tried to encourage people because I don't even know why it come where it comes from that people think it sounds weird or uncomfortable or something but mutual masturbation one being an incredible tool and also mm -hmm. whether it be non-mutual a one way both people are participating um and it being this like the personalized porn that we went back to this kind of show as exactly. one you, and know, you don't have to worry about zero camera angles. effort zero effort on the person putting on the show one might say and exactly. the effort to masturbate time efficiency there are just so many perks and exactly exactly um, and the other thing let's say the guy goes to uh, goes to bed and he doesn't really want an orgasm let's say he's uh instead of 25 let's say he's 70 doesn't really want an orgasm that feels like too much of a fuss um it's been said that men as they age become more like women they just kind of want that kind of connection. They want to feel excited. Mm -hmm. So she could say, well, what do you want? He goes, I want to have sex. And she'd say, no sex. What else do you want? He goes, let's simmer. We talked about it at the beginning. Let's just take a minute. Let me grab you. Let me inhale your scent. Let's breathe together. Let me feel excited. And then let's fall asleep. That's fine too. You got to get really granular about what exactly you're looking for. I like the simmering. And as I was going to say, um, for example, if somebody's not a nighttime person, maybe they're a morning person and really just taking the time efficiency, but mixed with like fulfillment and connection to the next level. For example, you've got somewhere to go in the morning. Um, you're going to take shower anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll take 10 minutes anyways. Fabulous. You invite your partner. Um, sexiest already in place free show ever in the shower no cleanup on the side of whoever exactly masked, come into know. the shower with her yeah. and watch her taking a yeah. shower and maybe she'll let you hold her at a certain point of time at the peak and uh give yourself an orgasm it's fine yeah so to wrap up my last question would just be thank you so much for actually giving so many concrete examples because i usually wrap up by saying like what's one specific piece of actionable advice yeah. or a suggestion for a behavior that people can really because the whole purpose of this show is basically an of bbxx not to have people learning in theory yeah yeah kind of understanding the concepts but really this is how i can enact it mm -hmm. and not having the excuses well i didn't know how to you know take that and then exactly care. so i would i would say i, so can I give love you the specific the simmering that you just simmering is, is a real is specific a one. simmering is just one example yeah. of focusing on experiencing erotic feeling, sexual arousal together on a regular basis, even when you're not having sex, whether that's clothed or unclothed. And uh, the key to psychological arousal and erotic feeling is that you're getting dumb and happy. You're just losing IQ points. It has nothing to do with hard or wet. It has to do with whether you just got a little stupid and a little buzzed together. And if you get stupid and buzzed on a regular basis, then you're going to be fine. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So nice to be here. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Mm -hmm.
Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to the BBXX podcast. You can learn more on our website or on our social media at bbxx.world. And if you believe in what we're doing, please do help spread the love by sharing this with someone you care about. Until next time.